Welcome to the Old Time Radio Westerns. I'm your host, Andrew Rines, and I'm excited to bring you another episode absolutely free. This episode is just one of over 80 episodes we release monthly. Each one is meticulously digitally restored and stored in the cloud, which comes at a considerable expense. To help cover these costs, you might hear some advertisements throughout this episode. While we retain the original commercials for historical authenticity, you may encounter modern ads. We promise to keep these ads to a minimum and try to place them where you would have originally heard them when they aired. If you prefer an ad-free experience, you can support us by becoming a member on our Patreon page. Go to otrwesterns.com slash donate. Again, that's otrwesterns.com slash donate for more information. I want to emphasize that we're committed to providing this content to you for free, but also want to be transparent about the financial realities of producing these shows. As a reminder, if you're listening to this episode on a service you pay for, please know that they do not support this podcast in any way, and the ads will be in this episode. Now, let's get into this episode. This episode is going to be The Lone Ranger. This is another two-part special. The original air date is November 1st and November 3rd of 1948, and the title is The Flashing Light. Let's get into it, and I hope you enjoy. With a speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high of silver, the Lone Ranger. faithful Indian companion, Tonto, the daring and resourceful mask rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fellow. I'll Silver. Hey! The town of Truckville began as a distribution point for materials when the railroad was being built and grew in importance as a focal point of Union Pacific activities. Most of those who lived in Truckville were connected directly or indirectly with the railroad. The Caboose, a small restaurant near the tracks, was owned by Widow Dorset, whose husband years ago had helped lay the tracks. It was after dark and the dinner hour was long since past. Ma Dorset locked the door and led the way into a private dining room in the rear. Come with me, gentlemen. She was accompanied by an old friend and official of the railroad named Gallagher and one of the smartest railroad detectives, Tom Greeley. 
Gallagher carried a heavy wooden box, which he placed on a table. <coughs> oh, my sakes alive, I'm glad to see you, Mr. Gallagher. It's been a long time since you came from the East. Yes, it has, Mrs. Dorset. How does your son like his railroad wagon? Fine, just fine, Mr. Gallagher. Jimmy's a good lad. He should go a long way. Well, Mr. Greeley, it's the first time I've met a railroad detective. Well, I'm beginning to think I'm not a very good one. You're good, Greeley. But you're up against Duke Warbler's gang. I see you brought a box. You know what it is, Tom. It's just what you asked for, built according to your specifications. Good, good. Close that door. I'll set up the apparatus here on the table near the window. We'll see how it works. That equipment was just one of two things I asked for. <laughs> yes, I know. I asked for someone to help me. Someone who was reliable, who knew the telegraph code, who was a crack shot with either hand, a hard fighter, and absolutely fearless. Well, personally, I thought you were asking for the impossible, but a friend in Washington found the man for you. Mr. Gallagher, I don't know what you're planning, but my boy Jimmy is reliable and honest, and if he could help in any way, why, he's well, brave. Thanks, Ma. We may call on Jimmy later. Where's the man you've selected? How soon can he get here? <laughs> Within five minutes. What? Look out that window. What do you see? Uh, nothing. Just level ground for about a quarter of a mile, and then a hill. And the moon coming over the horizon. A man is on that hillside. He's watching this window. He'll come as soon as I tell him to. You've got to send for him? No. He's watching for the signal of the flashing light. The Lone Ranger and Tonto had been camped on the hillside since late afternoon. Since darkness, they had taken turns to keep the rear window of the distant restaurant under constant observation. Silver stood nearby, saddled and ready to move on short notice. I've told you all I know about this situation, Tonto. I had the telegram from our friend in Washington. He said that the Union Pacific was in desperate trouble. He asked us to help. And I agreed. He sent another message telling me to be here tonight. And watch for a flashing light in the rear window of Maud Dorset's restaurant. Look, he must have it. A light. That must be it. And to go there and receive instructions from a man named Gallagher. Light, flash, dots, dashes, light, telegraph. That's right. It's a message. <laughs> Steady, Silver. We've got to tighten this cinch. You see what light say? Yes. Walk in the rear door without knocking. All right, that's what I'll do. Easy, steady, big fella. Wait here, Tonto. Uh, me wait. One silver. My sakes alive, that's the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. What miracles will electricity bring us next? How long shall I keep repeating this signal? You can stop flashing any time now, Greeley. I see our man riding this way. Look out the window. Uh, the white horse? Yes. The moonlight makes that horse look like silver. <laughs> You're laughing at it. Without realizing it, Greeley, really, you've put your finger on it. That horse is silver. Silver, huh? Don't be surprised when you see the man who's going to help you. He'll be wearing a mask. A mask? Oh, Mr. Greeley. Glad to see you. Mr. Gallagher. I'm Gallagher. This is Mrs. Dorset. How do you do? I'm glad to know you, Mrs. Dorset. I've heard a lot of fine things about you. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. And Tom Greeley. Heard of you too, Greeley. I hope you're geared for trouble. Do you have more than you can handle it alone? Yes, I have, and I don't mind admitting it. Oh. This is interesting apparatus. Could you see the flashing light clearly? Quite. Greeley designed that light. It's an oil lantern, you see. A regular bullseye lantern with a shutter to cut off the light. The shutter seems to operate by electricity. Yes, these batteries provide the current. Oh? The magnets here close the shutter just as they would operate the sounder of a telegraph instrument. I see. I operate it by using this telegraph key. When I press it down like this, it makes the contact. Uh The shutter opens to let the light shine out. When I open the switch, cutting off the current, the shutter drops back and shuts off the light. If you'll sit down, I'll tell you our problem and Greeley's plan to meet it. Very well. You you don't need me here, Mr. Gallagher. No, Mrs. Dorset. Not unless you want to stay. I'll go out front and finish cleaning up. Let me know if you want anything. One of the grandest women that ever lived. I knew her husband. He was a fine man. Her son is working for us now. A good boy, too. We have a lot of confidence in Jimmy Dorset. But to get back to the problem, have you ever heard of Duke Wobbler's gang? Yes. The cleverest gang of crooks that's ever been organized. 
They seem to confine their activities to the railroad. And they've stolen plenty. The Warbler gang has stolen valuable securities, mail, shipments of greenbacks, a cargo of silk. I tell you, that gang has hit us hard. And none of the loot has ever been recovered. We must smash Duke Warbler before he smashes us. The man who asked me to come here said you had a plan in mind. We have. I want you to meet a member of Warbler's gang. A member? Tom Sparks. Otherwise known as Tom Greeley. You? <laughs> yes, me. I've read newspaper accounts of Tom Sparks. He recently escaped from an eastern prison. Well, the real Tom Sparks is still in prison. Oh? With the cooperation of the authorities, we faked a story of his escape. I see. I took his identity, and by pulling a few strings, I managed to meet Duke Warbler. I've met several of his gang, and I'm to be included in the next big job. If you're that close to the gang, why don't you make some arrests? Well, I could place some of the gang under arrest at any time, but what good would it do? In the first place, we'd have a hard time proving a case against them. In the second place, we'd get only part of the gang. In the third place, we'd get none of the loot. That gang has nearly a quarter of a million dollars in stolen goods hidden away somewhere. That's why I need help. I'm going to travel with the gang and learn the details of the next big robbery. I'm going to pass those details along to you. And after that, it'll be your move. I see. I've learned this much. Yes? Duke Warbler works out all the details ahead of time. Oh? He doesn't take any of the men into his confidence until the last minute. Now, tonight at midnight, the train will leave here heading west. Yes. Warbler and some of his men, myself included, are to meet in a car on that train. Between here and the next station, we'll be given the details of the next robbery. You may be sure that robbery will take place before morning. You uh, have no idea what's to be stolen? Not the slightest idea. I'll find out when I'm with Warbler. From then on, I'll have no chance to write a note or communicate with anyone. Inasmuch as this will be Greeley's first trick as a member of the gang, he'll be watched like a hawk. Yes. That signal light is the means I devised to communicate with you. Oh. How? Well, here's the plan. The westbound train is being made up here in the Truckville yard. Yes? There'll be an empty baggage car directly behind the locomotive and tender. Next, a passenger car with a smoking room at the front. Uh -huh. Then there'll be other cars, mostly freight. Ending with a caboose. You'll be in the passenger car with Duke Warbler and his gang? Yes. There'll be no other passengers there, I'm quite sure of that. Huh. We'll sit in the smoking room. Now, I don't know how many of the gang will be on hand, but uh, here's the point. Yes? From the rear of the baggage car, you'll be able to watch the end of our car. This lantern and the batteries to operate it will be installed on the end of that car. How do you plan to operate the signal light? I'll operate it from where I'm sitting with the gang. You can't use that telegraph key while they're watching you. Well, I'm not going to. Huh? Here, yeah, look at this ring. Yes? Notice this projecting bit of metal? Yes. Well, when it's pressed down, it makes a contact to close an electrical circuit, just the same as a telegraph key. Oh. Now, I'll be the first to board that car, and I'll take a seat close to the window. Fine wires will be connected to this ring. They'll run out the window and along the outside of the car to the batteries and the flashing light. Then, while you sit and talk to the gang, you'll use the ring as a key and tell me the plan? That's right. I'll rest my arm on the window ledge. I'll let the window open slightly. I'll try to find out what Warbler plans to steal and how he plans to steal it. But I'll have to stay with the gang right through to the end. You said the baggage car would be empty? That's right. You can go on board any time between now and midnight. Get on board before the train moves off the siding so the members of the gang won't see you. I'm going to take a friend of mine, an Indian named Tonto, into that baggage car with me. That's up to you. Also our horses. I'll see that a ramp is provided for the horses. Good enough. We'll be on the train. Good luck to you, Greeley. Thanks. I'll be watching for your signals. We're counting on you. Counting heavily. I'll probably see you, Mr. Gallagher, shortly before midnight. Yes, I'll be at the train. Silver? They may have a lot of action between now and daybreak. Easy, big slip. Moon Silver! The strictest secrecy was maintained in the railroad yard at Truckville. The train that had just been made up was guarded by reliable men, and all approaches to the yard were carefully watched. The engineer and Gallagher, the eastern official, stood near a ramp that led to the side door of a baggage car directly behind the locomotive and tender. Murphy, two men and two horses were aboard the baggage car. Now, this is a very serious situation. You must keep everything dead secret or something tragic may happen. That I will, Mr. Gallagher. One of these men will wear a mask. Pay no attention to that. You are to take orders from him. Do whatever he says, no matter what it is. Mm. 
Looks like they're coming now. Yes. Oh, 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 Hello, Gallagher. Hello. Hey, this is Tonto. You'll be traveling with me. Good. I'm glad to know you, Tonto. How? And here's Murphy, the engineer. How are you? Hello, Murphy. I've instructed him to act on your orders. And I, I don't mind saying it'll be the first time I ever took orders from a man wearing a mask. Well, I don't know what orders I might give. Perhaps none. But you are to have absolute authority, even to stopping the train. Are any other westbound trains running tonight? No, the track will be open. There will be an eastbound out of Denver, which same will pass around the middle of the night. Very well. We'll get the horses on board. Well, me take scout, Denver. You can uh, get to your cab, Murphy. Take her away on schedule. That I will. Well, I guess everything is ready. That lighted car is the one the Warbler gang will occupy? Yes. Greeley will go aboard as soon as the train pulls out of the yards. The others will join him at the crossing a couple of miles west of here. Now, if you stand at the rear of the baggage car, you will see the signal light. It's been installed? Installed and tested. Well, Murphy is ready. Good luck to you. Thanks. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger story. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. to continue our story. Acting the role of Tom Sparks, escaped criminal, Greeley swung aboard the train. He was the only occupant as he sat down in the smoking room of the passenger car. He reached through the slightly open window, groped for a moment, and found two thin wires. He attached these to a special ring worn on his left hand. Then, pressing a small metal switch on the ring, he closed a circuit that caused a light to show momentarily on the front of the car. The Lone Ranger and Toto were watching from the rear door of the baggage car ahead. There it is, Toto. The light. Really is in place and ready. Ah. Train slow down. We'll stop at the crossing to take on passengers. That's where Warbler and his men are to come on board. Duke Warbler was accompanied by a thin, pale-faced individual called Slick and another man who wore the cold expression of a killer. The three sat with Greeley, who was known to Warbler as Sparks. Warbler did most of the talking. Right now, I want to lay out the program to you boys. That's what I want to hear. How big is this job tonight, Warbler? (laughs) Big enough. We're going to lift about $25,000 worth of negotiable securities. There'll be some stocks and bonds that we can turn... Tom Greeley's left hand rested on the windowsill. His thumb, bent beneath his fingers, manipulated the tiny switch on his ring. A switch that operated the flashing light that could be seen from the door of the baggage car by the Lone Ranger and Tonto. For your information, Sparks, I'll tell you that I have men spotted in the right places. One of the boys on my payroll keeps me posted on valuables that are being shipped. That's how I happen to know about this $25,000 prize. Where and when do we pick it up? It's in a safe in the baggage car of the eastbound coming from Denver. On the eastbound, eh? What kind of a safe? A good one. Maybe we should have brought some blasting powder. (laughs) Why use blasting powder when the safe will be open for us? You see, another one of the men who is on my payroll is going to be guarding that safe. And who guards the safe is on Warbler's payroll. Warbler got plenty crook in gang. Wait a minute, Tonto, wait. The light's flashing again. The light controlled by Greeley in the next car flashed dots and dashes at incredible speed. 
Tonto couldn't read the code, but he knew by the expression of the masked man's face that the signals were of grim significance. Tonto, what matter? Really had just sent the name of the guard. Man who's going to open that safe so Warbler and his gang can steal the money. You know him? Jimmy Dorset. The son of that fine old lady who runs a restaurant. So you've got Dorset lined up in your gang, huh, Warbler? He's not in the gang. I managed to bribe him to do this one job for me. That's all. How are we going to get from this train to the eastbound? Both trains, eastbound and westbound, stop at a place called Burkeville. This train gets there first. We leave the train and wait in Burkeville for the freighter. And that's the eastbound? Yes. Two of the boys will meet us in Burkeville. They'll have strong horses for our getaway. After we've got the stuff out of that safe, we take the horses to the hideout, huh? No, Smarts. We don't go to the hideout. I have other plans. We can't go to the hideout for some time. Not going to hideout for some time. The lights stopped flashing, Toto. Greeley's told us all he can. We catch gang at Burkeville? No, that won't help. We get some of the gang, but not all. We want the whole gang and all the money, gold and jewels that have been stolen in previous robberies. That's right. As soon as we pull out of Burkeville, I'll go and speak to Murphy, the engineer. The westbound stopped on schedule at Burkeville. The Lone Ranger and Tonto, watching through a slightly open door of the baggage car, saw the Warbler gang step down and join two men who waited near the track with extra horses. Then the train rolled on. One mile west of Burkeville, the Lone Ranger made his way to the cab of the engine. Murphy, I've got to transfer to the eastbound. Your best bet would be the top of Beacon Hill. That's only a couple of miles from here. That it is. I can let you off there, and then you'll only have a few minutes to wait. The eastbound will be moving slow after the uphill climb. You can board her easy. I'd hope to have more time before that train reached Burkeville. You want me to stop on the hill so you can take your horses off my train? Yes, Murphy. Stop at the top of Beacon Hill. Masked Man and Toto were ready when the train stopped a few minutes later. They got Scout and Silver off the train, then watched as the westbound moved on in the darkness. How long we wait here? Not long, Toto. I think I see the eastbound coming up the hill right now. Ah. We go on board? I'll go aboard. You stay with the horses. Bring Silver back to Burkeville. I'll meet you there. Ah, me do it. I'm going to try to get the valuables out of the safe and get off the train. I want the Warbler gang to think they have some competition. You want gang to think you crook? Yes. That's part of my plan to locate their hideout and find the rest of the gang. Here come train. I'll be ready to swing aboard as it passes. The eastbound was at slow speed as it reached the crest of the hill after a long upgrade. When it began to gather speed on the downhill run, the masked man was clinging to the side of the car in which Jimmy Dorset sat beside a small safe. The young man's face was drawn and tense in the lamplight. His lips moved as he murmured. A couple of minutes more. Just a couple of minutes and then... And I'll become a crook. What will my mom think? Oh, I'm glad Dad's not alive to see me turn crooked. I... What? Hello, Jimmy. Are you that, that mask? Why are you surprised? You knew what was coming, didn't you? But I... Is that safe unlocked? Yes, but... I've changed my mind. What? I'm not going to help... You just try to smash Ma's restaurant, and I'll find some way to get square. I'm not helping, see? I'm going to lock that safe. Now, hold on. You... Let me go. Let me go. You're not going to lock that safe. Now, listen to me, Jimmy. Let go of me. Listen to me, will you? I'm glad you changed your mind. Now, let me tell you something. Jimmy struggled with the strength that came of desperation to break free of the Lone Ranger's grip. Meanwhile, the train drew nearer to Burkeville, where the Warbler's men were waiting. I'm not one of the Warbler's gang. I don't care. Can't you hear me? I know your mother. Jimmy, you give me no choice. I've got to do this. I'm sorry, Jimmy. Sorry I had to knock you out. I've got to empty that safe and get away from here. Precious minutes had been lost. Jimmy lay unconscious on the floor as the masked man turned to the safe. The outer door swung open easily, but there was an inside compartment that was locked. He must be in his pocket. The train was moving slowly. Burkeville must be very near. Beads of perspiration appeared on the Lone Ranger's face as he went through the pockets of the guard. Finally, he found a small flat key. Oh, that's the one. These must be the documents. 
Can't take time to examine them. I'll just take everything that's in the safe. All right, boys! The train had stopped. The Warbler's men were waiting. The last man saw them through the partly open side door of the car, and he too was seen. Hey, someone's in there! The Lone Ranger smashed the lamp with one quick shot. In darkness, then, he turned to meet the gang. Get in there! Get your foot off! Oh, no, you don't! The fight was waged in darkness. Bullet after bullet crashed into the baggage car. Some chugging into the wall, and others hammering against the metal safe. The Lone Ranger returned the fire. Then Jimmy regained consciousness and tried to get to his feet. What's going on? Get back on the floor, out of the line of fire. Oh, Jimmy! You poor kid. You stopped that bullet the hard way. I'll use your gun. Some of the crooks were hit. Greeley, working with the Warbler's men, managed to do some damage to his own side. Then help came. Come on, Stay in that fight! The delay had given the train men a chance to join in with their guns. They came on the run from the engine, and Tonto, riding hard, came from the other direction, leading Silver. Hold, stop, hold, Silver. Oh. Me get him. The boys, boys, hit the saddle. Get clear. The odds had changed. Warbler and his men leaped to their horses and fled for safety. Are they calling on me? Call cats. Keep fire, Bastion. And be a gun saddle. While the trainmen emptied their guns at the retreating crooks, a masked man carrying a bundle leaped from the car to Silver's broad back. Then in the moonlight, the fireman saw his mask. Great Teddy. Don't load that gun. Why, you... I'd have gotten away with this stuff sooner if it hadn't been for that guard. He should have known better than to try and fight. Come on, Silver. Come on, stop. It was the next night when Duke Warbler faced his men with an angry frown. The man who got away with that cash is a smart crook. He left a silver bullet. Now listen, boys. Our next move is going to be to get that man. I want him dead. It was late at night when the Lone Ranger rode out of the valley in response to a signal light that had been flashing intermittently in the window of a hillside cabin. When he reined up, oh, 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 oh. he saw a strange horse near the shack and Tonto standing in the doorway. Railroad man, come here. Him ask for you. Uh, Mr. Gallagher? That's right. Easy, steady, big fellow. Well, glad to see you, Gallagher. Does anyone else know about this guy, Dad? You're the only one, as far as I know. But we're taking no chances. Otto stays here in case you come with news. I camp in the valley. Duke Warbler does happen to find our hiding place. He'll get only one of us. That's very wise. Have you had word from your detective? Really? Yes. No, he rode away from Burkeville with Duke Warbler. I, I haven't heard from him since. Anything new on Warbler or his men? Nothing. Uh, a warrant has been issued. They're wanted for the murder of young Jimmy Dorset. Yeah, they probably know it. That's why they're staying out of sight. Two Warbler gang get shot and fight at Burkeville. What about those two, Gallagher? The engineer shot two men, but he shot too well. Oh. Neither lived long enough to give us any information. I came here tonight in the hope that you might have learned something. I'm, I'm worried about Greeley. He took his life in his hands when he posed as a crook to join Warbler's gang. That was about the only way he could learn to hope for those crooks of hidden their loot. Yes, but the knowledge will do no good unless he can pass it on to us. Too bad Greeley couldn't have taken that light with him to the crook's hideout. He could have signaled in Morse code, just as he did on the railroad train. Yes, that's true. You better put the lamp out, Tonto. No use wasting oil. Ah, uh-huh. you put it down. That light is too bulky. That's the only trouble with it. The oil lamp, the shutter arrangement, and the batteries to operate the shutter all The loaded. control switch is small enough. It looks just like a gold finger ring. Yes. A moment ago, you mentioned the Morse code, the telegraph code. That reminds me of my reason for coming here tonight. Oh? What's that, Gallagher? We've been wondering how Warbler's gang knew when valuable cargo was being shipped on our trains. I think I have the answer. Oh? I think one of the railroad telegraph operators is working with Warbler. Oh? Stations all along the line are warned to be on guard when an important shipment is going through. Now, if one of our operators were in Warbler's pay... Any operator who would do it. I wonder if he is. Huh? Gallagher, I have an idea. You have? Duke Warbler knows that someone beat him to the loot in that last job. Someone who left a silver bullet. Yes, and he'll be out to get you. Gallagher, 
I'm going to let him find me. What? No, no, you not do that, Kimasabi. Him kill. Now listen. During the gunfight in Burkeville, Duke Warbler saw Tonto come in and fight on my side. What about it? It was quite dark. He couldn't see Tonto very closely. But he could see that my friend was an Indian. Yes. I'll pose as that Indian and go to jail. Uh, what? What do you mean? To jail, lad? I'll need a little time to get things ready. I've got to fix that flashing light inside a heavy chest, equipped with a good lock. I'll go into Truckville with you, Gallagher. I think we can find everything I need in one of your shops. I'll get back here before morning. Good morning. I'll drift into town at noon. You'll identify me as the Indian accomplice of the man who robbed the eastbound and left a silver bullet in the safe. But I wasn't at the scene of the robbery. I can't identify you. Sheriff Belding will act on anything you say. I don't see how you can hope to accomplish anything if you're in jail. I'm counting on some of Warbler's men to break me out of jail and take me to their hideout. So that's your plan? Yes, part of it. How will Warbler's men know what has happened? You're sure that they're intercepting messages that are sent along the telegraph line, aren't you? Oh, I see. You want me to put the news of your arrest on the wire. Do that, and we'll see what happens. The Lone Ranger outlined his plan in a little more detail then rode with Gallagher to the nearby railroad town of Truckville. In the dead of night, the official helped the masked man find the articles he needed, as well as a few simple tools in one of the railroad shops. It was nearly morning when the Lone Ranger returned to Toto in the cabin. Now, Toto, we'll fix the flashlight signal inside this chest here. Uh, and we got buckskin ready for you. I'll change your clothing after this chest is prepared. The bullseye lantern was fastened securely inside the chest, close to holes which had been drilled to let the light shine through. The shutter in front of the lantern, which opened and closed electrically, was connected to batteries, which the masked man placed next to the lantern. The switch that operated the shutter was cunningly fashioned to be worn on a man's finger. It had all the appearance of a fine gold ring. Now put those other things in the chest, Toto. No. Well, they'll be handy when I need them. I'll put in some matches to light the lantern. Uh, hey, that's it. Uh, you take plenty of risk, Kimasabi. Me not to like plan. Wait till you've heard the rest of it. Now we can close the lid. This lock is like one on a safe. A combination rather than a key. Otaro, we'll see how well I can disguise myself as an Indian... It was noon when the Lone Ranger, wearing buckskins and otherwise disguised like an Indian, rode into Truckville and reined up near the general store. Aye, aye. As he dismounted, aye. Gallagher and the sheriff stepped forward. There's the man, Sheriff. Don't make any fast moves, Redskin. Gallagher's taking me into his confidence. I see. Sheriff Building will cooperate in your plan. Good enough. I have to put on an act in case someone is looking. Not packing any guns, eh, Redskin? Oh, me not got guns. Stand still till I finish searching you. Oh, what do we got here? What's that, Sheriff? Bullet. Great day in the morning. Look at this, Mr. Gallagher. Yeah. It's a silver bullet, just like the one that was left in that safe. If that identifies him with the man who committed the Burkeville robbery. All right, lock him up. Gallagher hurried to the Truckville Railroad Station, sat down at a table and wrote a dispatch, which he handed to the telegraph operator. The message flashed along the telegraph wires. Duke Warbler's gang had taken refuge in an ordinary-looking farmhouse near the line of telegraph poles. At that point, a splice had been made in the wires. A line ran down the post, then underground into the house, where a man named Brassy sat before a ticker in a small room. Hey, Duke will be interested in this one. Brassy wrote rapidly as he listened to the metallic click. Then he shut off the instrument. Hey, boss. Hey, what is it, Brassy? You pick up something? I think I did. Warbler, it seems to me you're taking a big chance when you tap onto the telegraph line. <laughs> no chance at all, Sparks. If one of the linemen comes along, sees that splice, he'll follow the wire right into this house. Someone's on guard all the time. Any lineman gets nosy, he'll wish he had. And anyway, Sparks, I don't like it when the newest member of my outfit tries to tell me how to run things. All right, all right, Warbler. Don't get sore. 
Brassy, what's that mess? Here you are, just as I got it off the wire. Sheriff Belding in Truckville has arrested an Indian. What's this? Silver bullet. What about a silver bullet? The boys, get this. They picked up an Indian who was identified as the one who helped the man I want. The man that pulled that Perkville job right under our noses? Yeah. Hey, I remember seeing an Indian on that job. He rode up with his guns back. He brought the extra horse that his pal used for the escape. Yeah, if it hadn't been for the interference of that Indian and the engineer on the train, we'd have nailed that silver bullet thief. Hey, now listen to this. Sheriff Belding found a silver bullet in the Indian's pocket. Like the one that was found in the empty safe? Yeah. The man who left that bullet in the safe got away with a pile of money. That Indian's his partner. You'll know where to find the man we want. Oh, I doubt that, Wobbler. You doubt it? Well, I... Shut up! I want that Indian brought here. Well, make him talk. Good idea. Megan. Yeah? You're not known in Truckville. No. Take Jake and Lefty with you. And go there tonight. Get that redskin out of jail and bring him here. The people in Truckville went to bed early. The town was quiet when three men dismounted in a nearby gully, left their horses, and moved on foot toward the small jail. It was a hot night. The guard had placed his chair outside. He sat with it tilted back against the wall beside the door. There's the guard. Jake, you and Macon take care of him. Don't let him make an outcry. He won't. Come on, Macon. Right. We'll stop that tuna here. Don't make a move. Just keep your hands where they are, guard. Let's see if you've got a key to that there jail. Now, listen, boys. I'll Search him, Jake. We're friends of that redskin inside. We're taking him out. You keep quiet and you won't be hurt. Here's the key. Hey, give it to me. I'll go get the Indian. You can tell the sheriff that the critter who robbed the train at Burkeville came here to get his Indian pal. Yeah. Sure thing, gents. Sure thing. I'll tell the sheriff. You got him, Lefty? Yeah. Come on, I redskin. Who are you? Why are you come here? You're traveling with us. Got an extra horse over in the gully. Me not walk go. See here, I thought you. Oh, shut up, guard. Got a tie and gag that guard. Right. Yeah, I'll start out with the redskin. You can catch us. Go on, Indian, on your way. Where you take me, huh? Step faster. We're going for a ride. It'll be a roundabout ride, and it'll last a long time because we got to be sure we're not being followed. Me not go. Oh, I'm dead, wretcher. Going whether you want to or not. Here's the horse's mount up there. But me, Go me. On, get aboard that horse if you don't want a gun barrel fitted on the back of your head. Oh, here you go. See? This... You're going to meet someone, Injun. You're going to meet Duke Warbler. Get up there. Get up. I'll see ya. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger story. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. To continue our story, the Lone Ranger was disguised as an Indian when members of Duke Warbler's gang took him out of the jail in Truckville. They took no chances. Anticipating that they might be followed, they circled wide after leaving town and went to a small cave. There, they tied their prisoners' hands and waited through the remaining hours of darkness. Daybreak came, then sunrise. Finally, the Lone Ranger spoke. 
You say me see boss again. You'll see him soon enough, Redskin. Him come here? Ah, we're taking you to him. He wants to talk to you. He'll ask some questions, and you'd better have the right answers. He aims to know some things about your pal. Me not know who you mean. Ah, oh, yes, you do. You helped him escape from that baggage car in Burkeville the other night. That's not true. You tell that to Duke Warbler and see what he says. Where Duke Warbler? When me see him, huh? That's what I'd like to know, Lefty. I'm getting downright hungry. Now, how long do you figure on staying here? We'll wait until noon. If no one shows up by that time, we can be pretty sure we haven't been followed. Then it'll be safe to go to the hideout. It was well after sunset when Brassy looked up from the window near the telegraph set and saw four horsemen approaching the farmhouse. Hey, it's about time they got here. Hey, Duke, look out the window. Lefty and the boys are coming back with that redskin. Yeah. Yeah. Take a look. Hey, you see him? Uh, it took them long enough to get here. Well, they had to be sure they weren't following. Is that the Indian the rode in shooting the other night at Brookville? You wouldn't know, Brassy. It was too dark to see much yet. It must be the same one. Open the door and let him in. Right. Tom Greeley, who had joined the gang by posing as an escaped convict named Sparks, was at first relieved when he saw that the Indian was not Tonto, but he was slightly bewildered. There was something familiar about the captive's chin and the firmness of his mouth. The prisoner turned, looked squarely into the eyes of the detective, and winked significantly. Greeley's heart gave a sudden leap. He fought to keep his surprise from showing in his face when he realized that here in Duke Warbler's hideout, disguised as an Indian, stood the man those killers had sworn to get, the Lone Ranger. Here he is, Duke. Now listen, Redskin, your pal took some things that were in a safe on the eastbound train. We want that stuff, and we want him. Him go away. Why, you... That's for lying to me. Me not lie. Where is he? Him not near hideout. Him go away. Leave loot. You say you left the loot? Where is it? Oh, me not tell. Now I'll grab his finger and put a little pressure on it. <laughs> now I just hold that red skin. You better answer Duke's question. Me talk. Me talk. Where's the hideout? A uh, cabin on hillside. Loot in wooden box with special lock. Special lock? What do you mean by that? Lock like on safe. No key to lock. Oh, he means a combination lock. Box. Plenty special. Anyone bust them lock, get hurt. Plenty. How's that? Railroad torpedo. Also powder in box. Box blow up. That's mighty smart. Open box only. My numbers on lock. Mm. You know how to open it? Oh, uh, me know. How big is that wooden box? Can it be carried on horseback? Oh. Uh. You're going to tell us exactly how to reach that place, you savvy? Oh, me savvy. How long will it take there to get there and back? Two hours each way. Hey, good. You boys get your food and then start out. You right. should be back here by midnight. Right. Hey, now your hands are free, Redskin. There's a pencil and paper on that table. Now get busy. Tonto, Sheriff Belding, and the guard who had been left tied at the jail the night before, and several other men, including Gallagher himself, waited in the darkness of the valley. They had taken turns watching the hillside shack, and their vigil had been a long one. It was nearly ten o'clock at night, and everyone felt a touch of discouragement. Ah, doggone. When those critters came to the jail last night and took the prisoner, I thought sure the plan was going to work. So die, Sheriff. That's why I was willing to take the risk of being wrapped on a head or something. <laughs> what about the mess man? He's the one who's taking the risk. Yeah, you're right, Mr. Gallagher. If the Warbler's gang don't fall for his scheme, he'll be a gone goose. Maybe they've seen through his disguise. You wait. <laughs> what do you see, Tonto? Look up on hill. Three feller on horseback. Uh, it's pretty dark. It's hard to see. I can see them. They're raining up at the door of the shack. Let's close in on them right now. Take it easy, Whitey Gadget. Close in on them nothing. We follow them. We just keep those critters in sight. And if they go to a hideout, we wait and watch. We don't make a single doggone move until we get the right signal. Lefty and the two who rode with him found the wooden box. And remembering what they had been told about the blasting powder and the railroad torpedo... They handled it with the utmost caution. 
They rode slowly on the return trip. And it was after midnight when they reached Duke Warbler's farmhouse. We got it, Duke. Bring it in. Here's your box. This is a warning, the Redskin. Oh, that box. You put them here on the table. Lefty, you take care of the horses. Right, Duke. I'll take them right back. Uh, Redskin, let's see you open that box. Oh, untie hands, me open. You maybe better stand them back, huh? Yeah, I'll cut the rope free his hands. I've got a knife right here. All right, Sparks. You sure you can open that box without setting off the best blasting powder? Oh, me sure. There, your hands are free. I'll go to work. You... Stand here, hold top of box. All right. Pull up while me turn numbers. I'm getting back to the other side of the room. Yeah, me too. Stand ready in case that Indian tries any tricks. Right, sure. sure. Lift him up on lid. Me work him lock. Tension gripped the room while the lone ranger, disguised as an Indian, turned the dial of the combination lock. Tom Greeley stood close at his side. The box rested on a table and a small hole that had gone unnoticed faced the nearby window. Now, lift him. Like this? As the detective lifted the lid, the Lone Ranger glanced at the men who stood together near the opposite wall. He reached inside and grasped a cylindrical object. He raised it overhead. Now I'll take over. Stand where you are. I'll blow you to eternity. Hey, what's this? He's no Indian. What's he got? This is a bomb. I drop it or throw it. A railroad torpedo will set off a blast. As he spoke, the Lone Ranger's other hand was busy inside the box. With deft, quick movements, he struck a match and lighted the lantern. Then he slipped a ring on his finger. What sort of a switch is this, anyway? You wanted me, didn't you, Duke? You're no Indian. That's right. What about it, Tom? Is it the right place? You bet it is. The loot's concealed in the back room. You, Sparks, you're siding with that critter. You bet I am. Why, you double cross? Hold it, Macon. I've got a gun to back his play. Pretty smart. Who are you, Sparks? What's your real name? It's Greeley, Warbler. Tom Greeley. And I'm working for the railroad. Uh, are they all here, Tom? All except Lefty. He went out with the horses. Here he is. Hey, what goes Get on? over there, Lefty. Over with the rest of the gang. This is the showdown. For a moment, Lefty stood bewildered. Better do as he says, Lefty. That Indian is a phony. He's holding a bomb ready to throw. Lefty stood riveted by the door, his eyes staring. Meanwhile, the Lone Ranger thumbed the switch on the ring inside the box. Unseen by those within the room, the flashing light beamed out dots and dashes across the open country. In Morse code, the Lone Ranger said, Close in. And as he signaled, he hoped and prayed that Tonto and the lawman were near enough to see and act. Now that's a bomb, huh? I drop it. You'll all be blown to kingdom come. I do as you're told. Get over there with your friends. My fun, I will! Let me threw caution to the winds and caught the Lone Ranger by surprise when he leaped at the upheld cylinder. <laughs> Tom Greeley snapped a shot. The bullet struck Lefty in the shoulder and sent him spinning. He fell to the floor, wounded but still grasping the bomb. Put that out of boys? Take him! Now let's get him! That's a It's the showdown, Tom. I'm with you. All right, there was no chance for gunplay as the outlaws swarmed on Tom Greeley and the Lone Ranger. It was hand-to-hand fighting with no holds barred. The Lone Ranger fought valiantly against heavy odds. His fists swung like sledgehammers. But each time a man went down, there was another to take his place. Even up, Tom. Hold on as low as you can. I know. I am his working force. I hope. Blow after telling blow landed on all parts of the Lone Ranger's body. His breath came in burning gasps. He knew that his strength was running out, that his time was measured in seconds. Then he saw Tom go down. Can we get that one now the other? In the fury of the battle, no one heard the approach of horses that were reined up outside. The Lone Ranger felt his knees grow weak. He could hardly stand. He was falling, falling, and as he went down, the door burst open, and Tonto led the reinforcements with a war cry. <laughs> regained consciousness in the hillside shack. He opened his eyes and looked around, then realized that he and Tonto were alone. You all right now, Kimisabi? Tonto. All the Warbler gang in jail. What about the loot, Tonto? Was it all found? Uh Uh-huh. All found. Tom. Tom Greeley, I remember he went down. Oh, him all right. Uh, Him knocked out, that all. Then we did it. We did it, huh, Tonto? Um, that's right. <laughs> I wondered if you and the others would see the flashing light. Uh, we see it. 
I didn't wash the clothes in until we were sure we'd get the whole gang as well as the loot. Flash and light. Plenty good ID. Oh, I'll sit up. I'm all right, Toto. A little while, I'll be as good as new. Ah. Uh. That flashlight, Toto. That was a smart idea, Greeley had. Ah. Uh. Only trouble, light and battery so big, so heavy. There'll be some wonderful signaling devices in the future, Tonto. Right now, there's a man in the east who's working on a light that will burn by electricity. It won't need any oil, and it can be lighted by simply pressing a switch. Oh, that's plenty good. And who that fella? He's a young inventor who did so much to develop the telegraph. His name is Tom Edison. I... I wonder what the future will hold. I wonder if the day will come when the light and the batteries can be made so small and so efficient that the whole thing can be worn on a finger ring. <laughs> That's asking a lot, isn't it, Toto? I wonder if it's asking too much of science and invention. is a feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated, created and produced by George W. Trendle and directed by Charles D. Livingston. Tonight's story was written by Fran Stryker. The part of the Lone Ranger is played by Brace Beamer. This has been a presentation of otrwesterns.com, and we hope you enjoyed. Please take some time to like and rate our shows in your favorite podcast application. Follow us on Facebook by going to otrwesterns.com slash Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel by going to otrwesterns.com slash YouTube. And send us an email, podcast at otrwesterns.com. You can call and leave us a voicemail, 707-986-8739. This episode is copyright under the attribution non-commercial share like copyright. For more information, go to otrwesterns.com slash copyright. Have a great day, and thanks for listening.